Hello, everyone. I'm Alyssa Palai, and it is my pleasure today to welcome you to the Playbook webinar series. Today, we're going to discuss lean and agile methods and software that reduces product development timelines by up to 50%. Our speakers today are David Paulson, our CEO and president, and Greg Katai, VP of Business Development. In terms of agenda, David will give you a brief introduction to, play, the playbook, to playbook the company, the problem playbook solves, as well as review companies we have worked with to achieve an extreme reduction in product delivery timelines. He will also highlight the playbook method and then demonstrate the playbook software that supports this method. After the product demonstration is completed, Greg Katai will discuss how easy it is to get started with playbook. He'll also let you know about a special offer we are running for attendees. And then he will guide us through a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. First, please feel free to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. You can type them into the question box. Just for your information, only David, Greg, and I can see your questions. I'll gather them up and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also, if there are any questions we do not get, it to, get, get to during the Q&A session, not to worry as we will respond to you personally. The webinar will be available on demand after the presentation. We'll email all attendees the link. Please feel free to share it as you see fit. We would be also grateful for any feedback you have, so please shoot it through. You can simply contact us directly. My email address is on all communications. Just hit reply. It's time for us to begin today's session with David. David, I'll now turn the call over to you. All right. Thanks, Alyssa. Hello, everyone. The uh, story of um, who we are really started 16 years ago when myself and my two business partners, Paul DeLong and Eric Graves, uh, we all quit our jobs as mechanical engineers, and we went out and started offering consulting services around engineering processes and tools. So this was way back in 1998, and we spent the next 10 years uh, optimizing processes and tools for companies that, you know, that made investments in these areas. It was in 2003 that we first started studying lean and theory of constraints and other you know, management science principles. And then in uh, 2008, we decided we wanted to learn you know, the whole product development process. We were very good at engineering, but we wanted to know what came before and after it. So we went through PDMA's new product development professional certification. And during this first decade, we worked at over 60 different companies. And this created an ideal environment to rapidly learn what worked and, more importantly, what didn't. So every company we went to, we had just learned some stuff, and so our toolbox kept uh, increasing every time. Now, you'll notice from this slide, this is just a few of the logos, but you'll notice that these are companies from every industry and every company size. Some of these companies only have a few engineers, and some have a few thousand. So even though they were quite varied, they all had a few things in common. And one of those was they wanted it to go faster. There's a huge financial opportunity for having a um, superior product development performance. Now, I know this scares a lot of engineers because they think they need more time to do the product right. But I can tell you, if you do it right, you can increase quality and speed at the same time. So besides all having the same goal, all these companies had the same problem. On average, 90% of new products are late. And there's a lot of reasons for this. And we used to, well, at some of the companies, we do a deep dive root cause assessment. And uh, we've kept track of all the issues we've ever seen, as well as their root causes. But recently, a few studies were done across the industry. And so I'm showing these as a summary here. And they're showing the same things we see all the time. Uh, a lot of companies have engineering time that's wasted. They're working on non-value-added stuff. Most companies have too many projects for their resources, so they're jumping around multitasking all the time. Um, they can't manage their priorities because it's unclear what is really a true priority or what's uh, what people just think their priorities compared to what they think their priorities are. And then the schedules are mostly are highly inaccurate because it's impossible to tell what's really going on versus what the plan was. And then they're not good at capacity planning. 
one of these studies showed that 70% of these companies are looking for new methods and tools. So those are the reasons why they're late. So now let's look at the impact. There's this concept called cost of delay that was um, first introduced by Don Reinertsen. And this shows how the detrimental impact of being late is on profitability. Most product teams, if you ask the team members uh, what happens if we're one month late to market, they'll just guess and say, well, well, we'll lose a month of sales. But it's actually much worse than that because if you don't get to market when you plan to or at the peak of the window, you don't just lose a month of sales, you won't ramp up to the sales volume that you originally planned to. So you'll lose uh, revenue and profit that's represented by the green area between these two curves. And that actually adds up to be quite a bit of money. In fact, we teach our customers how to calculate cost of delay, and we've been keeping track of it. And our average we're getting is a half a million dollars of lost profit for each month that they're late. And that's not revenue, that's profit. Um, the lowest we've ever seen was $200,000, and it's very common for it to be over a million dollars. So these companies are telling us they're on, on average late, you know, four to 12 months. And so this equates to about two to six million dollars of lost profit per product launch. So it's actually a very expensive problem and it's no wonder people are trying to fix it. Well, the other thing they have in common is many of them are still using the old standard waterfall or phase gate product development process. Now this is a very simplified uh, version of that, but they get the requirements somehow. They define what work needs to be done based on those requirements. They create a plan and schedule for it. They start doing the work, and then they start having status meetings. And when they get close to their goal, things start happening that they didn't expect. And they'll actually finish the project just doing these two things until it's finally done. So we looked back at our you know decade of experience over all these companies and what we could learn from Lean and Agile. And we put together a new set of methods that looks like this. So all of the green boxes are new, and the blue box you know, is the same from the last slide. I don't have time to go over this in detail, but I can tell you it's, or you can tell that it's very heavily front loaded. We do a lot more work up front to ensure that the execution part of the project goes much smoother. So we got the chance to um, implement all of these methods all together at once, you know, for the first time in 2008 at this medical device company. They had been in business for two decades, and they have a, a, a very complicated electrosurgical device. It involves um, software, um, electrical, mechanical, and mechanical includes injection molded parts. They have a, because it's a medical device, it's a very um, heavily regulated industry, and so quality is a, um, very high priority in their process as well. So over this um, two decades they had been in business, their average product development cycle time was two and a half years or 30 months. The best they had ever launched a new product was 20 months, so they set a goal to shorten that by 10%. So we Im implemented these methods you know, all together on this project and they completed it in 12 months. They told us later that their budget usually was a their plan budget was usually exceeded by two to three hundred percent because of how long it took. And they finished this project 20% under budget. So there was a hard cost savings of about a half a million dollars, as well as an additional profit of about three million dollars because they were early to market. And notice that I'm comparing this to their, their goal and not their average. So this uh, metric was, I would say, an order of magnitude better, bigger than anything we had got in the past, um, but we didn't know if it was repeatable. So the very next company we went to was a completely different type of project. It was a large aerospace company, and their IT department was upgrading one of their enterprise systems. It was actually PLM. And the last time they had done this, it had taken them 24 months, but it had been a few years, and since that time, the scope of doing it again had actually doubled. There was more data, more users, and the functionality in the software had doubled as well. They hadn't finished creating their project plan, but they were very concerned it was going to take a long time. So we implemented the exact same set of methods, and they finished this project in 10 months, even though it was twice as big as the one that had taken two years. They 
didn't have a product to launch, but they recognized the, the, just the hard cost savings of about a million dollars. So at this point, we realized, okay, these methods um, really work. So we started rolling them out um, to a, over a dozen project teams. And when I say methods, and the tools were uh, spreadsheets and project boards and things like that, and it was all manual. Um, and all of these customers that we implemented this, they told us the same two things. They said, number one, we love this process. It's our new standard. And number two, can we have software? And at first, we said no to that second question because one lean principle says, keep it simple, do the simplest thing that works, right? But uh, after a while, uh, we realized there could be some benefit from automating some of this. And so since we were good at implementing tools and processes, we went out in the market and looked. And nothing existed that would do what we needed it to. Um, so we looked back at our um, processes and said, you know, what could we automate? What's the um, biggest benefit w we could get? And it turned out it was down here in the uh, execution foundation. So this is what we chose to automate with Playbook. And uh, I'll give you, uh, you'll see all the examples in the demo, but I'll give you one example here, these daily meetings and project boards. I'm guessing many of your companies uh, are already doing this or you've seen these at conferences or something like that. But um, what they do is they have um, a war room with project boards in it and each board represents a different project and each sticky note represents some amount of work that needs to be done by somebody. There's many uh, formats for this and we went through six like, major generational improvements before we got to one that we thought worked really well. Um, and customers actually loved this, and, but there were still a lot of problems. And I'll point out a few things. In this example, the pink sticky notes are supposed to represent the critical path. Well, it's pretty clear that everybody thinks their task is on the critical path, and I can tell you it's not. Um, each column here represents a given period of time. So if I look at the three or four sticky notes here, I can't tell if that's uh, four hours of work or 40 or 140 hours of work. I can't tell when it was started, when it'll be done, and when it is done, it doesn't tell me what to do next. The other major problem was remote people can't participate. We tried setting up webcams and everything. So as, uh, as well as this worked, it still had some major drawbacks. So anyway, we decided to um, work on the software and we wanted to really embed some key principles you know, out of Lean and Agile. And so I'm gonna go over those before I show you the demo. The first one is uh, granular tasks. This is similar to the small batch concept from Lean. And small batches uh, is a great Lean method and it applies in multiple areas in product development. And one example is uh, planning your tasks in more detail. The reason you can't do that now is no one has, not everybody has access to the project management tool. and if you added that much detail to it, it would become impossible to use. But the problem with having a project plan that's full of tasks that are four weeks long, you won't know the task is late until the end of the fourth week. When you ask for a, a status update after one week, they're gonna tell you it's 25% done, and at the second week, 50%. So you don't get this feedback on delays until really late. If your tasks were one day long, you would know the next day if it was late or not. So it um, greatly increases the rate at which you identify delays. The next concept is immediate reprioritization of tasks based on critical chain. Um, so I showed you that one example where they thought every task was on the critical path, and it's not. The problem with current planning tools, you can create your critical path or critical chain, but things change so frequently, and the task, the project is usually only updated every two weeks, it's possible that you had the right critical path when you updated it, but the next day something happened and now the critical path jumped. So you could spend the next two weeks expediting things that aren't on the critical path when in reality things that are are just sitting there being ignored. Uh, the next concept is uh, a lean principle called pull. The opposite of that is plan and push, and that's what traditional systems force us to do. Someone creates a plan, they tell everybody what they're supposed to do and they give them due dates and they try to push the work that's supposed to be done. Paul says, we need to have a prioritized backlog and when we have 
our current task done, we will pull the next most important task off of the top of the, the backlog and work on it. If we do this every day, everyone on the project team will always be working on their own most important task. Um, this greatly reduces multitasking and it limits the work in progress. The next concept is uh, don't overload your people. Don't put in too, uh, too much work into the system. This is based on um, queuing theory, which is actually science. We may not have, have studied it, but we all live it every day when we try to drive somewhere um, during rush hour. Traffic on the highway or in a town greatly slows us down when it's um, at a high capacity state. If we made the same trip in the middle of the night, we would get there much sooner. What's interesting is every manufacturing engineer knows this and they all plan their work for 80% loading because they know things will happen during the day that will take up that 20% that buffer that they have planned. So their schedules are accurate and they'll get their work done. What's interesting upstream in product development, our variability is much higher in terms of uh, the tasks we're working on and how, lo how long they'll take and uh, how quickly they arrive. So we actually need more spare capacity. The next one is this concept of um, shared project buffers. So if you're a good project manager and you actually ask your resources for their time estimates, I guarantee you, you will get back uh, buffered answers. If someone thinks something will take five days, they're going to tell you 10 because they know they'll get interrupted and they don't want to be the late person. So you're going to get all these buffered answers, and when you put your plan together, it's going to be as long as it could possibly be. But because of some psychological principles and Parkinson's law, which says work fills up to take the amount of time allotted, even though you have the longest possible schedule, it'll actually take longer. So if we uh, implement this concept of shared buffers, we teach people to give their 50-50 estimates. Don't buffer your own tasks. Um, We'll, we'll, share, we'll all share a buffer together that's much shorter than the total of the, the individual ones. And this creates some psychological peer pressure because you don't want to be the one that eats the team's buffer. The next concept is uh, decentralized and rolling wave planning. The problem with you know, one person in the project management office creating the plan is they don't really know the details of the work that needs to be done. Um, but it's impossible with current tools today to have the team members do the, share in the planning. But if you could, those people are the ones that know best what it's actually going to take to get this work done. And so they'll create plans that are much more accurate as well as they, they have a lot of buy-in because it's their ideas and not someone else's. And then the rolling wave planning concept, you update these periodically um, and look forward and you know, keep them up to date. And then the final one is these um, came from Agile software development methods, and that's the concept of these uh, stand-up meetings. All of our customers used to tell us that they had too many meetings, when the real problem is it wasn't the number of meetings they had, it was the effectiveness of the meeting. When you have uh, meetings, status meetings every two weeks, it takes a lot of time to prepare, uh, and then you're getting information, a big batch of information in that meeting that has uh, details that you wish you had known two weeks ago when they happened and not two weeks later during the status meeting. So these um, status meetings greatly increase, increase communication and uncover issues just as, as rapidly as possible. So those are the principles. I'm going to jump in and, and give a demo and try to highlight each of those, uh, how they're represented in the software. So here I have um, I just opened up Internet Explorer. Our uh, playbook is hosted in the cloud, so anyone with a web browser can get to it. I am logged into our demo site right here. Um, I'm going to maximize the screen so I get a little more real estate. Once you're into the uh, system, the first level of context is this project tab, and this is where all the projects are rep uh, represented. We have customers right now that have over 20 active simultaneous projects. Once you're looking at your project, um, we have four tabs here that I'm going to go over. The first one is the one I'm on now, the game plan, and this is where we create our plans. And then the next one is the huddle, and this is the one we use in the um, stand-up meeting. 
and this is so this is the team's view of their current project and their daily tasks. And then we have the my playbook view. Most of our customers, their team members are on multiple projects. So this is the view where the individual can look at all of their tasks across all of their projects in one place. And then finally the dashboard. So uh, first thing to point out in the game plan, it looks very much like a Gantt chart and there's a good reason for that. Uh, Gantt charts actually have a lot of valuable information just by looking at them. We can tell when things are planned to start, when they're planned to end, what their durations are, who's supposed to do them and things like that. The problem with Gantt charts uh, typical ones is they're hard to update and maintain and, and access by the team members. So across here I have uh, the months and the days and the weeks. Each dark line represents a, a week or a weekend. And then um, the green bar represents today. These gray bars you see, we call these summary tasks. And this is where the project manager logs into the system and creates a high level outline of the project. And these can be project phases, they could be based on your bomb structure or a combination or however you want to set it up. But once the project manager does that, then they turn this tool over to the team members that actually do the work. And each summary task has an owner, and that summary task owner gets these people together and adds the detail within these summary tasks that are necessary to complete them. So I'm expanding a few of them here so you can see the embedded detail. First thing to notice is most of the tasks are one to three days long. These long tasks here represent lead time on parts, so we know, you know, how long when that part is due. A um, couple other things: the um, color represents criticality. So the pink items are the items on the critical path. The orange items have some slack. I'm actually I have the slack showing right here. So this number in brackets is the days of slack in these tasks. I have it set to turn orange when there's five days of slack or less. So that's kind of warning this team they're getting close to being on the critical path. The yellow tasks have more than five days of slack. Tasks with a black diamond are intermediate milestones, and this task with a green diamond is the major milestone. This is key because the major milestone is what drives our criticality uh, backwards up the chain. Now you'll notice I have a, a long um, yellow task here called a buffer. And this is that shared project buffer. So we told the team members when they create this plan, give us your um, you know, unbuffered estimates. And um, I have a, an eight-week project, basically, with a 12-day buffer. But I guarantee you that's much shorter than if every task had their own individual buffer in it. So a um, couple more things to notice. Tasks, some of the tasks have a solid border. These are tasks that are scheduled, they've already been started, or they have a specific due date. And then some tasks have a dotted border. These tasks are in the plan state. And so what happens here is um, I'm showing the resource name. So if Bob knows he's gonna, he had planned to start this tomorrow, if something happens, he gets sick or called out on another project, and he has to delay this, all he has to do is click on it and drag it to the right two days and let go. And he's just updated the plan. This is based on reality. He's not going to be here. He can't start that, whatever. But notice that we instantly saw the impact. The first thing that happened is we lost two days of our buffer, obviously, because this was on the critical path. And as well, the team up here noticed that they got more slack. Another one might be that when we, this team created this plan, um, they estimated the lead time for this part to be 20 days. Now that they've started, Ken has had time to call the vendor and get a quote. So um, we estimated it was gonna be 20 days. If we get lucky and they tell us they can expedite it because it's on the critical path and do it in 13, all I has to do is grab the end of that task, drag it to 13 days and let go. And again, he's updated the plan based on reality. Notice what happened, these tasks turn orange, they're off the critical path, these guys turn pink, they are. And down here, we just save five days in our buffer. So um, this is really uh, simple, easy to use, flexible, robust, whatever. Um, a lot of information just in the picture. But the real value of this, I think, um, becomes apparent when we start using this in the daily meetings. So this is where the team has their, their stand-up meetings around the project board. And on this view, each resource is a row, and every column is a day. And all of these tasks, oh, and the green bar is today. 
And all, so all of these tasks are the, the tasks that each resource has on their plate for this project for today. Now these aren't just random, they actually came from our plan. Um, so I'm going to open up the uh, view into the game plan from here and I'm going to hide the filters tool. So each of these tasks, if I click on them, they're represented, I can see where they are in the plan. So if John wants to see where this came from, he can see what just happened, why this is due, what comes next, you know, how much slack they have, where um, all this work is coming and going to. Um, so this gives people a, a clear picture of what they're doing and why. Now the tasks that you don't see are the tasks down here that have dotted borders, and these are in the plan state. So these exist in our backlog. And I can look at the backlog here and all of these tasks, again, I can click on them and see where they are uh, in the plan. So what happens now is um, they'll have a daily meeting and this is the work they, well, let me back up and show you some more interaction. This task right here, it's a two-day task. He started it yesterday, he's working on it today. Let's say that he finds out at the end of the day he can't finish it. All he has to do to let the world know and update the plan is right click and say add segment. And when he does, it adds a segment for tomorrow. It updated the plan. If I scroll down here, I can see that, yeah, I ate a day of the buffer. Uh, another scenario might have been we planned this for three days and Bob realized he's on the critical path, so he worked overtime and finished it early and he doesn't need to work on it tomorrow. All he has to do is say remove segment. Now that goes away, I got a day of my buffer back. So that's how reality, the work that's being done in real time, is updated and reflected in the work in the plan. Another thing that might happen is they'll look at this, uh, their plan for today, and notice that Bob has a lot of critical path tasks, and Sue doesn't. She has um, some availability. We didn't know this when we created the plan, but they decide that morning, let's have Sue do Bob's next task. If we drag this down here and give it to Sue, Notice it pulled my critical chain back. So this is how the team can make instant, real-time, valuable decisions based on accurate priorities and impact the schedule every day. Uh, a couple other things to show you. We mentioned um, we can't overload uh, people. We have to work at a lower capacity state. So each task um, not, knows not only its duration, you know, how many days long it is, it knows how much work is in it. So these dials you see right here are capacity dials. If I put this task uh, on Bob's day, notice that capacity dial filled up halfway and it's green. That's because this task has four hours of work in it. To change it, all I have to do is grab that bar and start dragging it. As soon as I go over 50%, um, that dial turns yellow. When I go over 75%, it turns red. When I go over 100%, it actually explodes. And there's a reason for this, and it's um, to show everybody at a glance if the work they have planned for that day is realistic or not. It's possible that Bob might have loaded his day like this, and we can look in the daily meeting and say, Bob, you're way overloaded. You know, are you really going to do that? Can someone help you? Um, let's update your day so the, the schedule's more realistic. Um, last thing to show you on this view is, um, well, two more things. When a task is complete, um, all I have to do is right click and say mark complete and it cross hatches it out. And so these are tasks that have been completed and they're updated in the plan. So it's very easy to tell now when this task was started, when it was finished and how, much, how many actual work hours went into it. Notice that some of these tasks have a, a black dot this represents, um, this tells us in this view that this task, has, this person has everything they need to start that task. All of the predecessors are done. You can see that in the plan if it has a predecessor or not, but on this view you can't. So um, if I unmark this complete, notice that the, this has a Q dot and these tasks don't. As soon as I mark this complete, now this Q dot jumps over here and this reprioritizes my backlog and says I have one critical path item that's queued up and ready to be started and I have another um, task that's queued up and ready to be started but it's not on the critical path. So this is how we have clear and accurate priorities in our backlog all the time. Now then, um, most of our customers have people working on multiple projects. 
So um, we have a view for that called My Playbook, and it looks like this. And this is where each individual can look at all of the projects that they're working on, you know, that they're currently working on. So I'm show, showing the projects for Mary, and she's work, she has three active projects right now. Um, this, by the way, all of these projects, um, again, I can look across, um, I can look at the task in relation to the plan across projects just by clicking here. So it shows the context for all of this again. Um, so I want to demonstrate uh, what a typical Playbook user does in Playbook each day and how much it takes in order to keep the whole system up to date and running. So I'd encourage you to um, start a stopwatch or look at your clock if you can and uh, watch how long this takes. So what happened is uh, Mary might have gone to one or two or three daily meetings. Um, they don't take that long and sh she can self-select which meetings she needs to go to based on the tasks on her plate and in the backlog. So after those daily meetings, she comes back to her desk and says, okay, here's my projects, the most important projects on the top. This is what I committed to to finish. Um, she starts working on this and when she finishes, she can resize this if she wants to keep uh, accurate time of how long this takes and then mark it complete. Now these uh, task is queued up and ready to be worked on, but she has another um, thing she's working on. She's a manager and she's been working on the budgets for two days or it's due today. So she works on that and resizes it and then marks it complete. And then she notices she has time before it's time to go home, and so she looks in her backlog and decides to work on the tasks on this project. So she pulls this task out. She works on it for a little while and uh, resizes it. And she didn't finish it, so she adds a segment for tomorrow. And tomorrow she thinks she can finish it in that much time. So instead of marking this complete, which would delete the other segment, she just closes out the day. And what this does is it tells everybody this information is, you know, fairly accurate and up-to-date and whatever, and I'm done. You can also click on this, which will close out all your days at the same time. Now, the last thing she does before she goes home, she looks at her plate for tomorrow because this is what she's committing to the team members that she's going to do. And she notices she's way overbooked. And she remembers that this project, this task is going to take all day. It's been scheduled for a long time. She doesn't want to do it, so she finds it another resource back here uh, that has availability and as well as skills that could do this. So she grabs this task and reassigns it to Sue. Um, Sue will get a flag when she logs in that she has a task she hasn't seen before. Um, you might want to call the person and explain why if you want, but that's all you have to do. Now she looks at her day and it's fairly loaded. She has five and a half hours of work planned. That's a good uh, place to start your morning. So she hits save and she goes home. Now stop your stopwatch. That whole interaction should have taken about two minutes, and that's all it really takes by every team member to keep this system going. The only other thing we uh, encourage is weekly or uh, on some standard cadence, have the summary task owners get their team together or, or look in their summary tasks and update them. You know, what happened, what changed, what my goal for next week, is the plan accurate, and can I, um, add out more detail into the future. And that, you know, roughly an hour a week or so on rolling wave planning. So um, that's pretty much it. One thing I didn't mention in the huddle view is um, we have uh, customers that have about 18 people active on some projects and they can do their daily meeting in the morning in less than 10 minutes. The last thing is the dashboard here. Um, there's a couple um, things we can look at. One is the utilization table. And what companies use this for is you can look at um, the past history of all of the projects and all of the resources and uh, where they're spending their time. So it shows you um, for each resource how many hours they're spending on each project. You can look at the project totals and see that, yeah, 50% of our staff hours are being spent on this most important project. That's good or whatever. Um, this example, we don't have a lot of data loaded into the demo site, um, so instead I'm showing a, a utilization graph, and in this time I chose to look forward. I started it on Monday and looked forward through the rest of the month, and I'm lo looking at all of the projects for just one resource, and this happens to be um, John down here. 
So basically, the green bar is today, and this says this is what he did in the past. He has a little, little overloaded for tomorrow. Um, next week, Monday looks fine, but he's got about 10 plus hours for the rest of the week. So Bob should look ahead and say, uh, somehow level this, get rid of some of the work, extend it out, or, or do whatever. So um, that's pretty much it for the demo. I will put this back and uh, get the presentation going. So at this point, I want to um, turn it over to Greg, and he will uh, finish with the rest of the presentation. Thanks, David. Uh, if any of you have, uh, we have some questions that have come in. If you've got more questions, uh, now's a good time to get them typed in. And at the end, uh, here in a few minutes, we'll go through and answer those. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to, like to just do a quick summary here. Um, David showed you the seven principles, which are the kind of core uh, foundation to the software, which comes straight from the lean and agile hybrid method that we uh, have, have, uh, have developed. And ultimately, what this really is about is, you know, once implemented, what it really gives you is clear priorities and better communication. Um, that's what our customers tell us, and that's extremely important to high performance. Ultimately, that leads to faster projects, reduction of timelines, uh, and a side benefit is happier, uh, happier teams. Ultimately, that then turns into financial performance, and that's kind of the name of the game. That's what we're trying to do is improve the, the bottom line of these companies that we work with. Uh, help them be more successful in the marketplace. Uh, you don't have to take our word for it. Um, we have customers that have given us some some great quotes uh, that really back up a lot of these claims. You know, so communication is so much better. That's a direct quote from one of our customers. My team is empowered. Their day is less confusing. Um, uh, people can see daily what's happening. Uh, I like I like this next one, which is from a, a project manager. Now I can focus on strategic planning. So really kind of moving up the value chain just in terms of the type of work that they're able to do uh, and much less of the chasing people around for updates. Um, and then uh, we like to pick on Microsoft Project just because it's so prevalent out there. Everybody has it and tries to use it. Uh, and we have quite a few customers that have said, yeah, this really renders it uh, you know, kind of useless for this type of work. It's just not built to do um, this sort of project management. Uh, so next I'd like to tell you a little bit about how uh, you actually get started. And so, you know, we've in working with uh, with prospects of ours as well as customers, um, you know, questions that always comes up, is this a big, complex, ugly project? Uh, is this like SAP? Is this, you know, something like that? Do you need a lot of infrastructure? So the answer is no. It is not a complicated project. It's not a big science project to put this in. Uh, in three weeks from today, if you were to start with us tomorrow, you would be implemented with lean and agile methods and the software um, on a live project. So uh, we've got this package down to a three-week startup. Uh, week one, uh, if we look at the graphic, is to get the system installed and configured. Installation literally is a few buttons to push on our side. Um, it's, it's in the cloud. Um, or for companies that have security requirements or other things that uh, just make it so they, they can't work in the cloud, uh, we can do on-premise installations. Um, so that's up and running in day one. And uh, with the rest of the day, since it doesn't take a lot of time, we train on the lean and agile methods and principles, uh, and also on the software. The software training is generally two to three hours, and people are, are pretty good. Uh, from there, it's really working on the plan development, getting in the near-term milestones and tasks. And so for the rest of the week, it's getting your initial project or projects into the system. Uh, from there then, the next couple of weeks is really reinforcing the methods and coaching on how to run the daily stand-up meetings, how to do your task updates, um, how to do rolling wave planning, and to uh, you know, help with that. So that by the end of three weeks, you know, essentially week one, the training wheels are on. Week two, we're starting to push it down the sidewalk on the bike. And week three, the training wheels are off and you're pedaling on your own. So we, we provide the training and the coaching. Um, with the goal of having you fully operational, at, at least in a pilot project, um, you know, certain projects you want to you wanna start with within three weeks. Uh, the licensing is an annual subscription. Uh, and people ask us, you know, what does it cost? Uh, typical solutions, you know, services and, and software, depending on users, 
starts anywhere from around 15,000, and you know the, the range has been 15,000 to 150,000. It could be lower, it could be higher. It depends on the number of users. It really depends on how deep you want to go uh, in some of the more advanced methods that we do, uh, and also um, if you want to have a, you know a large community of users. And then uh, of course there's the money question, and the pay, you know the CFO of a company says, how are you going to pay for this? Well, the ROI is a no-brainer. I mean, we've really worked hard to get the price down. And so with, with the ROI, uh, it, it pays for itself very quickly. From a straight payback standpoint, you should expect to get your money back in weeks. And that's a great investment by most metrics. OK, we mentioned that there would be a special offer. And so um, you know, for anyone who's attended the webinar today, and as long as we have you, you know, registered, uh, we are offering three months of the software for free. And so uh, to, to do that, you have to be a new customer or a new division of an existing customer, and you have to buy an implementation package so that we can get you trained and able to use the software. But you won't have to pay the software for the software for three months. And so if you decide you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it, you'll still get huge value from the methods. But if you do, and we fully expect that you will, um, then you pay for it at that time. So you get uh, a pretty lengthy trial. Um, here to really assess how it's going to work for you, and we're very confident you're going to be happy with it. Okay, so um, now we'll move on to questions. That really concludes the webinar. Um, I guess in terms of contact information, uh, if you'd like to learn more, you know, we have our website at playbookhq.co. Uh, that's not a typo. We didn't forget the M. Um, it's playbookhq.co. Uh, you can contact me directly or anyone else on our website and uh, either by email or by phone. And you'll also find quite a bit of information on our website, both about the methods as well as the, the product. Thanks, everyone. Bye.